matter how many times they rise, they will be destroyed. Their time is over. We will consume all of them. What is up, people? Van from the Vanverse Gaming Channel here, bringing another review video. Today's video is going to be on a game called Remnant from the Ashes. I did a review on this game back in 2020, but a lot has changed since that review. And so I wanted to do another one here in 2023 because I wanted to give people a good review of the game to see if it's something they want to pick up and play through Why they wait for Remnant 2 to come out later in the year. So if you've never played Remnant before, hopefully this video is helpful. And if you have played Remnant and you want to come back and play through it again, hopefully this review video will help you get back into the game and get you set for the sequel that's coming. So without further ado, let's launch into the review. Okay, so before we dive into the review, let's talk about what Remnant actually is. So Remnant from the Ashes is a third-person survival action shooter. It's set in a post-apocalyptic world that is basically overrun by this creature called the Root. You are one of the last remnants of humanity, and you are setting out to try and figure out how to stop the Root from overtaking the rest of the world. There is a bunker that you're all kind of held up in. There's very few people left, and you are now responsible for heading out and tracking down the, what they call the founder to figure out what happened and try and fix everything that is going on. Now, this game is co-op, so you are able to play with up to three players. So you can invite two players into your game. And so that's really cool that they have a co-op option, and it makes it a lot of fun to play this with other friends. This is a third-person shooter, not first-person, so it's kind of an over-the-shoulder. But I will say that the mechanics that are used in this game make it the, the gameplay feel really fun, which we'll get into here in a minute. When Remnant first released back in 2019, it did not have a lot of the things it has today. So in 2020, they actually came out with an expansion pack called the Swamp of Courses. This basically took one of the zones in the base game and just expanded it. It added more bosses, it added more events, uh, more guns, etc. And then in addition in that expansion, this which came out in April of 2022, they also added the survival mode, which we'll cover here later in the video, which is pretty fun if you've played a lot of the game and you feel like you've maxed out and want to challenge yourself. You and that same group of up to three people can start with naked with a pistol and you have to work your way through the different levels, beat bosses, gain gear, and try and see how far you can go before you finally are killed and you perish. In addition to that DLC, in August of 2020, August of 2020 they came out with another DLC called Subject 2923. This was an addition to the actual game, so in a complete separate DLC where they took the original story from the base game and they expanded onto it with a second campaign mode. They added another area called Resium. They added more mobs, more guns, more bosses, another damage resistance type and cold damage, etc., etc. So if you didn't play this game after 2019 or if you haven't played it recently there's a lot of additional dlc content that has been added that i highly recommend you jump in and give it a try so now that we kind of covered what the game is what it's about and how does it function let's get into some of the gameplay and how the whole thing works okay so now let's talk a little bit of how the game works when you start the game out you start in a boat and you end up washing up on a shore and this starts the tutorial of the game this is going to go in and teach you about the game, talk to you about how to sprint, how to crouch, how to dodge roll, how to vault, you know, melee attack, etc., etc., how to equip weapons, um, just basics. You're going to get to a point where you black out and you're going to wake up in Ward 13. This is where, again, you're going to go through some more tutorial work, and at some point, you're going to be asked to choose a class. The three class options that you can start with are the Ex-Cultist, the Hunter, and the Scrapper, and... Ultimately, you can pick whatever you want because you will unlock everything else for all of the classes as you play the game, but which one you start with is probably very important, and everyone recommends the Ex-Cultist. And the reason everyone recommends the Ex-Cultist is the weapon mod that they get, the long gun and sidearm, and then also the traits they get. So the spirit trait plus the mender's aura that you get and plus their, um, their cultist set this gives you the ability to use a healing aura that you can stand in, and then you can also increase the regeneration to be able to keep reusing that ability. 
as well as the duration of that ability. So that's why people recommend the X Cultist. But ultimately, the big difference on the starting classes are what armor set you have and what it provides you, which long gun, sidearm, and melee weapon you're given, and then which traits you unlock right out of the gate, and which weapon mod. That is why a lot of people go with the X-Cultist. For new players, it's probably the best one. Melee builds in this game are very difficult until you can get up some really good traits, or if you're just very good at dodging and dodge rolling, you probably have a pretty good chance with it. But I recommend X-Cultist first. I also like running the Hunter as a starting class, and then once you get really, really far in the game, you could possibly start out as a scrapper. Now, once you pick your, your class, you're going to do a little combat, you're going to get your weapons, you're going to get your armor, and then you're going to finish the tutorial. At this point is where it's going to unlock the base game, and you're out of the tutorial, and this is where people can join your mode and join your co-op mode, and you can start progressing through the game by using one of the different modes that you have available. So we'll go into that here now. Okay, so after you finish the tutorial, you'll open up a crystal. This is kind of your teleport, but it's also where you will choose your world settings. If you click on world settings, you're going to see you have an option of campaign mode, adventure mode, and survival mode. Campaign mode is the main mode that's going to take you through a story. You're going to play through Earth, Rom, Corsus, and Yesha, all the different worlds, and then you're going to be asked to kill a boss and complete the game. Adventure mode is where you can go back to each individual world and just target that world. This is a procedural generated map game where when you play through the campaign, you're going to be exposed to certain bosses and to certain dungeons and events that there are many more. So what you would do is once you've played through Earth, Corsus, Rom, Yesha, and completed the game... You would come back through and say, okay, I want to go to Earth. You'd do an adventure mode and just pick Earth and try and unlock different bosses and get different gear, etc. Or you could choose to reset your campaign, re-roll it, and then play through the whole campaign again. Which, if you're a completionist, I would highly recommend doing this. Because there is a item that you get in the game that you have to give it to one of two different NPCs. And so your first campaign... Th play through you give it to one you re-roll the campaign you play through again you give it to the other if you're a completionist if you're not a completionist it does not matter now the third mode is called survival mode i would not recommend this mode unless you're pretty good with the game or you have some friends that are pretty good at the game this is basically the see how far i can go before i die mode and this only unlocks if you bought the courses dlc uh this is this came with the courses dlc and then you play through this. Now, you start in this little room where you have a pistol and you have pretty much a couple gold or a couple whatever scrap. You buy a couple items and then you just start running through the different, the different zones. As you progress through, you loot things, you pick things up, but you have to stay at a pace faster than what the creatures level up. So you'll see there's a little tick mark of how fast you're leveling up versus how fast the worlds are leveling up. And if the worlds are leveling up faster than you, you're just, just makes things much harder. So what you'll do is you'll run through a world, you'll get to a boss, and if you kill that boss, the timer pauses, you go back to the same room you started in with your new scrap, and now you're able to purchase more items and continue to grow your character and can continue to run through. If you die, you start all over from scratch, and now you start the whole thing over. And why it's called survival mode is pretty simple. You keep fighting until you die. You survive as long as you can. This is really fun if you have a group of friends. My only downside to survival mode in this game is you cannot save it nor pause it. So, say you have to step away for a minute and you have to leave in your middle of a boss fight and you die, you're done. Or, say you got through five or six bosses, you've been spending a couple hours, you can't save the game and then jump back in where you left off. You have to keep playing the whole time through until you're done. So if you're really good and you're killing a lot of bosses and you're doing really good on your run, then you have to almost leave the game running until you can play again because there's no way to save it. That is the one downside to survival mode. I really hope they fix it with Remnant 2. But if that was the case where you could play through, take a little break, and then come back and start where you left off, that would make it even more exciting than it is today. So those are your three modes, campaign mode, survival mode, and adventure mode. 
And ultimately, campaign mode is about 13 hours. I think that if you do pick up the Resium DLC, if it's called Subject 2923, there's a campaign mode there. That probably adds another six hours. So if you played through both campaign modes, you're looking for about 20 hours of content. However, because there are so many different options, like there's two world bosses on almost every map, each world boss have two different kills. Depending on which way you kill them, you get a different item. There's tons of different dungeons. There's tons of different, you know, events. So if you're a completionist and you want to complete it and get every item, every trait, etc., then you could easily put over 100 hours into this game. But if you're one of those people that are like, okay, I just want to play the game, check off the box, I beat it, and move on, this game's only going to offer you about 14 hours of play. And then with the Resium DLC, the Subject 2923, another six. And so I would not recommend playing it like that. Now, that is just how the game works. Procedural generated, and you keep playing through the same content. Almost like a Borderlands or something like that, but instead of having to get to like 30 and then play again to get to 50, you're just resetting it almost every, you know, 12 or 13 hours. Because the whole concept is to earn traits, level up your traits, so that you can become stronger to be able to do more in the game. All right, so now that we kind of talked about the campaigns and the survival mode and all that, let's start talking about the customization of your character, weapons, armor, etc. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about weapons and armor. Then we'll talk a little bit about the trait system. And then finally, we'll get into the mod system and how it all comes together. So first, when we're talking about weapons and armor, the game is very simple. They have many, many different types of weapons and armor sets. In addition, there's rings, there's other um, necklaces and things like that. And almost everything in the game is either going to be purchased from a vendor, just randomly found on the ground, part of an event, or you get a crafting item when you kill a boss. And so you start off with your weapon set, whatever it is. If you pick, you know, ex-cultist, you pick hunter, you pick scrapper. And let's just say you pick the ex-cultist like I recommended and you start off with a long gun. Well, then you can say, you know what, I'm not really a fan of the long gun, and then you could go to a vendor and buy a hunting rifle. Or, as you're fighting, you do an event, and after you complete the event, you get the assault rifle. And then once you have that gun, you pick up scrap throughout the game, you can choose to continue to upgrade that weapon from 1 to 10 using scrap, and then using some other type of components, and it kind of has different tiers where if you're a certain level, you're going to only get certain tiers of stuff to drop, and as you try and upgrade higher and higher, you're going to require higher level materials. In addition to that, every boss drops an item in the game. The world bosses drop two of them, depending on how you kill the world boss. Those can be turned into boss weapons. Boss weapons are better than regular weapons. They're stronger, and they also are harder to upgrade because you require a different component to upgrade them. So when you can level a weapon up to level 10, you can only level a boss weapon to level 5 because every upgrade is almost two levels of the other type of weapons. And so that is really cool in itself because depending on your style of play, you can choose, do I want to be up close and shoot them with a shotgun? Do I want to be a, a range guy and snipe them from really far? Do I want to be a melee and really focus on my melee weapon? So there really is a lot of replayability to try and unlock all the different armor and all the different necklaces and rings and everything so that you can do different builds. So once you, you kind of have that under control, you get the different weapons, I highly recommend you don't upgrade them. The difficulty of the game scales based on the weapons you upgrade. But actually upgrading your weapons and armor doesn't have an impact on your on your um, strength. Where the game really affects your impact is when you get into traits. So traits are things that you can level up from 1 to 20 points. And they give you different percentages on some of your things. It could be your stamina. It could be your health pool. It could be your regeneration of your mods. It could be your melee damage, your range damage. There's just... Many, many different options. So where the game really excels is you want to level up your character so you can earn experience, so you can upgrade your traits instead of upgrading your armor and weapons. And then you can start pairing traits together. Like you can get, oh, weak spot damage is increased by 20%. 
and crit damage is in or crit percent is da is increased. So I'm gonna pick a sniper rifle and put a bunch into those traits. So I'm just shooting everything in its weak spot, usually its head, and I'm just one shotting everything, and that's the build I want. Or you can say, hey, here's one where it increases my melee damage. Oh, and look at this, I got these Wolverine claws, so I'm gonna build a melee scrapper build. And so the combination of the traits and leveling up your different traits in conjunction with your weapons and your and the different rings and stuff that you get and the mods is what makes this game super fun to keep customizing and wanting to keep replaying through all the different zones to unlock everything. And the last thing I want to talk about in this section is the mods. So every weapon you have, except for your melee weapons, your, your long gun and your short gun, have the ability to add a weapon mod. There are many, many different weapon mods that you can add, and they all regenerate on a certain mod regeneration timer, and they all have certain things like duration and all that. And that's why the X Cultus is so cool, because the one that you get from there is a heal circle that you can put down as your mod on your weapon. And if you increase your mod regen and you increase your mod duration, you can put that circle down at last super long, and then on top of that, you can heal for more and you have, you'll get it back more often than if you didn't have the increased duration or in the increased mod generation. So that's kind of the concept of the game. Play through it, keep regenerating your different maps to destroy all the different events, bosses, etc. Unlock all the weapons, level up your traits, and just have a great time doing it because it just feels good. Okay. That is my take on that, and so in the next section, we're going to actually get into the controls, and then we'll finish up with the gameplay and the combat. Okay, so I want to just do a little brief review of the controls for Remnant from the Ashes. Now, I've played a lot of FPSs and RPGs and action RPGs, and one of the first things I do is I change the controls. The key bindings drive me nuts. Conan, I had to change my key bindings. Um, that Dark Envoy game... Almost every game, I've had to change my key bindings. But what's interesting about Remnant from the Ashes is when I got in and started playing it, I just started hitting buttons. And if I hit a button that I thought should be crouch, it crouched. If I hit a button I thought should be sprint, it sprinted. You know, jump. Everything felt good to where I almost felt like I didn't have to change any of the key bindings because it just made sense. The only thing that took a little getting used to is the melee attack if you weren't holding down your right mouse click and the double right mouse click to zoom that takes a little getting used to from some other games i'm used to playing for the most part your left click is going to be shoot and you hold down right click to zoom in this game if you're not holding down your right mouse button and you're playing on keyboard and mouse then you're going to do a melee attack if you hold down your right mouse then you're going to get your normal reticle. If you double tap your mouse, your right mouse button, then you're going to get your zoom. That took a little getting used to. Other than that, the controls were just great. And it just really made me think about how someone put a lot of thought into the controls and how simple it was. And that combined with the sound effects, the, the actual responsiveness, just makes this game feel good to where you actually want to play it and everything just kind of clicks. So that's my point on the controls, and now I want to get into kind of how the gameplay works, and then at the end, we'll show you some combat, so it'll just tie it all together. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the gameplay in Remnant from the Ashes. So Remnant from the Ashes is an action RPG, so a lot of the combat is going to be you fighting against multiple creatures, and they're coming from all sides. There are some actual mods in the game that can help you with this, but you will be constantly attacked by all sorts of different creatures coming at you, and you're going to use your weapons to try and kill those creatures. Now, you will be able to dodge roll a lot of things, and that's a lot of this combat is dodge rolling. So for a first-person shooter, there's a lot of dodge rolling. There's also melee combat, so if you do run out of weapons, melee combat is an option. And even if you don't run out of weapons, you can actually structure your traits so that you do nothing but melee combat, where some bosses and some creatures, that's a bad decision, it's still pretty fun. So as you progress through the zone, each world you're going to enter, you're going to start with Earth if you're in campaign mode. There's a main zone, and then you're going to branch off into these smaller zones. Every time you branch off, you're either going to go to a, an event or a dungeon that's going to have a creature to kill. And as you do that, you're going to keep progressing. Some dungeons don't have an end, and you'll see that once you get to the end, there's a stone. You would just click that and say leave dungeon. That means you have to go a different direction on the main level of Earth. 
and you'll eventually keep progressing through until you get to a world boss. So every zone, every world, Earth, uh, Corsus, Rom, and Yesha, and Rhesium, they all have two world bosses that you're going to have to get one or the other. And each one will have two ways to kill it. So some of them is like shoot out its legs and then kill it, or there's another one is kill it without shooting its leg, etc., etc. And so once you kill that world boss, you will then be moved into the labyrinth, so to speak. And the labyrinth is kind of like the middle that connects all the worlds, and that will allow you to progress to the next world through the campaign. So the gameplay has a little bit of a Dark Souls feel to it because on every single level, there is a crystal that you can either click on to save or click on to refresh all of your ammo, refresh all of your health, etc. As soon as you click on that, it's going to reset all the enemies. So it functions very much so like a fire, uh, a fire pit in uh, Dark Souls, is that you are going to reset everything as well as bring all of your stuff back. They also function as a teleportation system to transport back and forth toward 13. So just keep in mind, similar to Dark Souls, whenever you click on any of those, you're going to reset all the enemies that were in that area. In addition to that, it's also a little bit like Dark Souls in the gritty darkness of it, but also in the combat. A lot of the combat can be difficult. There's a lot of ads that come at you. There's a lot of attacks. And so you're going to spend a lot of time dodge rolling. And ultimately, your traits that you have on your character and the mods you're using are very very much so going to impact how you're going to beat a fight. And some of the fights can be very brutal, which is why I think some people compare this to Dark Souls, is some of the boss fights can be hard, and also just how you have to dodge roll a lot to not take damage, and how the campfires work. So that's a little bit about the gameplay. Now I want to dive into the combat. Okay, so let's demonstrate the gameplay a little bit with a fight that I did on the Earth world with a dungeon boss named Gorefist. I think this is a really good example of how combat works, especially boss fights, and we'll go into it here. Now, I'm using a long gun as my assault rifle and my short gun is an SMG. I have a fire mod on my, on my assault rifle and then I have a summon mod on my SMG that allows me to summon these skulls that will help fight for me for a certain amount of time. And basically, Gorefist is a melee boss where his whole goal is to just charge at you and hit you with his big sword. So when, you, when he goes to hit you, you just have to dodge roll and iframes. And if this whole fight was just fighting him, it would be super easy. But like every fight in Remnant, when you're trying to do combat, these, there's always going to be adds of some sort. Even if you're in the regular world and you're not fighting a boss, you're going to be getting attacked from all different angles. So wearing a headset and listening is really what's going to save your butt, where you don't actually have to look. You know they're coming because you can hear the sound behind you, like these silly heart-looking things. I hear them running at me because they scream. So I know they're coming at me, and then I have to either shoot them before they get to me, or try and dodge right when they explode so I don't take damage. So that's why you see me dodge rolling a lot. Obviously, most people who are probably better at the game than I am aren't going to dodge roll as much as I do. But I like to dodge roll everywhere and have a stamina bar so that I don't take any damage. And then the mods you use are going to be very important in this game. Swapping out the different mods, depending on which boss you're fighting, is also very helpful. And also your traits. Building your traits around what weapons you're using and mods you're using is going to be very good. That's why we use the X-Cultist. You can see that when I pop one of these mods, that there's a timer before I can use it again. And there's also a timer on how long it lasts on my weapon. And so using traits to increase the duration of my mods and also the re-cooldown time on them is really impactful because mods do contribute to a lot of the damage that you're going to do in the game. So hopefully this was a good demonstration of what the combat looks like. Swapping back and forth between your weapons, using the mods on your weapons, and then in addition making sure to use the right consumables and resistances and trying to iframe and dodge damage is really how the combat goes. It's very fast paced, it's very chaotic, there's stuff coming at you from all angles, and that's why I feel like the gameplay and the combat in this game is some of the most fun I've ever had. So I hope you guys enjoyed this segment. Let's get into the summary of Remnant and finish up the video. So now I wanna give you my final summary of Remnant from the Ashes. When this game first came out, I didn't play it, I didn't know what it was, but in 2020, I got into it, and I gotta tell you, it's probably one of my favorite games I have ever played. 
the way that the mechanics work, the simplicity of the movement and the combat, the different weapon and armor choices combined with all of the different things that you can pick up in the ways of jewelry, you know, rings, necklaces, the traits and the mods, the replayability of this game is super great. And it is also very fun in my opinion that I have no problem running through and killing everything over and over again to loot new weapons, new armors, uh, increase my traits, etc. But I feel like some people might think this is a repetitive game. There's only 13 hours in the main campaign, probably. If you pick up the second DLC, the one that is that Subject 2923, you're going to get another four or five hours, maybe six. So combined, you could blow through the campaign in 20 hours. Once you do that... The game is technically over unless you want to go back through and start playing the campaign again or if you want to go into adventure mode and start trying to re-roll all the different worlds to make sure you're doing all the dungeons, you're getting all the traits, you're getting all the weapon mods, you're getting all the other stuff. And that's really where the game excels is the replayability, the customization, and keep running through and trying out different builds and unlocking different traits, etc. If this is something that you do not enjoy and you just want to get through a game, beat the campaign, and check it off your box, then you might be disappointed with Remnant because it doesn't offer a lot of content. You have 20 hours of content if that's the case. But if you try and re-roll it and do adventure mode and try and unlock every single boss fight and every single dungeon, you could probably play this game for 100 plus hours. I know I did, uh, especially trying to re-roll some of the dungeons and some of the uh, different events it might take you a bunch of times before you finally get the one you're looking for but i really enjoy it i enjoy the gameplay i enjoy changing out all my all my customization and on top of all that the co-op in this is super fantastic like this game is one of those games that's just super fun to have one or two friends jump in and kill everything together and then if you think that you're bored and that your character is just too darn strong, you're on the hardest difficulty and everything is easy to you, that's when maybe you should go to survival mode. Survival mode really is a lot of fun. My only issue with it is, is you can't stop, so if you have a good run, you're stuck leaving your computer on until you can come back and play it, or you're stuck doing a five, six, seven hour kind of thing, depending on how good you are, which I really don't like and I hope they change in Remnant 2. So all in all... If you like Dark Souls games, or if you like first-person shooters, and you like action RPGs, this game is going to be a fantastic game for you if you haven't tried it. I'm super excited to see what they do in Remnant 2, since I love this game so much. But, if you like those types of things, you should pick up this game, play the crap out of it, and get ready for Remnant 2. If you don't like games that can be difficult, or you don't like games that require you repetitively going back to the same worlds to unlock different things, and you're not really the completionist type, then maybe this is not a game you should get into. But you may want to at least play the 20 hours to get used to it, because maybe they'll change that in Remnant 2, where it's longer on the base campaign, and not so much of procedurally generated maps. I hope you enjoyed this review video. I'm trying really hard to make these better. If you like it, go ahead and give us a like. Leave any comments you want in the bottom here, and I'll be sure to answer them. And check back for more review videos on other games, as well as my other videos on RPGs and other things that I like to play. This is Van from the Vanverse Gaming Channel. Thanks for watching. Cheers, and peace out.